Today I'm going to be showing you one of the most famous and shocking chess moves ever made and it was played in the position that you see before you. Bobby Fischer with the white pieces was up against a true legend of the game, Tigran Petrosian. Known to be an almost unbeatable opponent with a rock solid defensive playing style, but Bobby was about to blow that defense apart with a move that was totally unexpected and came as an utter shock not only to Petrosian but to the entire chess world as well. So we are of course going to be taking a look at that move as well as the moves that lead up to this famous position. But before we do, if you haven't seen this game before and would like to pause the video, I encourage you to have a look at this position and try to determine what is the strongest move for white. What would you play and what move do you think Bobby played that rocked the entire chess world to its very core? Feel free to post your answers in the comments along with your rating. But now let's go back to the beginning of this game and see just how we got here. Bobby Fischer playing white kicks things off with his favorite move e4. Best by test, it's 1971 and in this seventh game of the final candidates match to determine who will challenge Boris Spassky for the world championship, Tigran Petrosian responds c5. The Sicilian defense, not afraid to meet Bobby on his own turf. Bobby loves playing this with white or black. We have e6 from Tigran going for some early activity with that dark squared bishop supporting a potential pawn thrust to the center. Bobby plays the thematic d4 going for peace activity. Both his bishops now have open diagonals. The pawns are traded and now a6 from Tigran, the con variation preventing any white piece from landing on b5 especially this knight which could hone in on that hole he's created on d6. Now here Bobby plays a move that is not very good in many lines of the Sicilian, but here it's probably the strongest, and that move is bishop to d3. Waiting on developing any of his queenside pieces due to black's potential to apply some early pressure on that side of the board. For example, if white were to just go ahead with the normal queenside kind of development with knight c3, bishop to e3, and queen to d2, then black can make life difficult already for white with bishop to b4, pinning the knight, threatening to capture on e4, and if you defend with bishop to d3, then here comes d5, adding more pressure. If you take on d5, then the knight comes to d5, more pressure on c3, hitting the bishop. This is not going well for white at all. Hence the decision in this position to play bishop to d3 maintaining that queenside flexibility. We have knight to c6, hitting the knight on d4, and if you haven't studied this opening, it might not be very obvious to you that knight takes c6 is the strongest move for white, increasing his central control. And after castles, we have a very well supported d5 thrust. Why would you allow black to get this beautiful central pawn structure? Well, the reason is that white is now ahead in development. With the bishop on d3, the king safely castled, and it's his turn to move. Another point is that if black had played knight to f6 here instead of d5, then white could kick that knight with e5, since the knight on c6 has been traded off, so there's no knight takes e5. But anyway, it's Bobby's turn to move, and he plays c4, the top engine move, looking to break down this beautiful structure. And you might be thinking, hey, Let's just gain some space with d4. Well, that's not great. You're giving up control of e4, so white will be able to get a knight there. After pushing the pawn to e5, opening up his bishop's eyes towards your king side. And with the pawn on e5, you won't be able to play knight to f6. So Tigran puts that knight on f6 while he can. And if you're wondering about e5 in this position, well, it would be a strong move for white if not for d takes c4 counter-attacking the bishop and clearing the excellent d5 square for the knight to jump into if this bishop moves. So Bobby instead goes for the trade down on d5. This is better. And here, out of the three different ways Tigran could recapture, he chooses the worst option, which is e takes d5, accepting the isolated pawn. So let's briefly look at the alternatives and why he maybe rejected them, starting with knight takes d5. He probably didn't like the looks of bishop to e4 with the pin, and after bishop to b7, white can increase the pressure with moves like queen to f3, 
knight to c3, and then rook to d1. But the engine says this is fine. Black may still end up getting the isolated pawn on d5, but at least he's keeping that e6 pawn in front of his king for a bit longer, and he'll be able to get that king to safety by castling. The other option, queen takes d5, is also good, despite the move knight c3, developing a piece with tempo on the queen, usually not something you want to allow, but here the queen can safely drop back to d7, followed by bishop to b7, with the potential for queen to c6, setting up the mating battery. But in the game, we have e takes d5, exposing the king. So as white, I would probably just play rook to e1 without even thinking about it. And black does have the two bishops that he could use to block, so it's not as bad as it could be. But Bobby begins with knight to c3. We have bishop to e7, preparing the castle, and now queen to a4 check from Bobby. And if you're like me, you're probably wondering, what's the point? Can't the bishop just block? Well, yes, but he's looking to get quick access to that beautiful d4 post. And at this point, Tigran plays a move that might surprise you. Instead of the natural looking bishop to d7, which was the better move, he plays queen to d7, dangling a little carrot in front of Bobby in the form of a tactic. Take a moment if you like and see if you can spot that tactic that white now has. In three, two, one, Bishop to b5 is an opportunity to win the exchange, which Bobby did not go for. But the point is, the black queen is pinned to the king and will be won unless a takes b5 is played, which drops the rook on a8. So why would Bobby reject this? Well, after black castles, he's got some compensation. He's got the pass pawn on d5, the bishop ready to develop to b7 with tempo on the queen, pointed at white's lonely king side. And although white is still the preferred side, Bobby felt that this would make life a little easier than it needed to be for Tigran. And so, in this position, he chose rook to e1 instead, which is a stronger move. Tigran now prudently decides that he needs the castle soon, and so to facilitate that, he first trades queens so that his bishop can get to e6 quickly, blocking the rook's access to the bishop on e7 so that he can castle next. Bobby now plays bishop to e3, headed for c5. The engine liked bishop to f4 a little bit better to support one of the rooks landing on c7 because it prevents black from playing bishop to d6, which would cover that square. But bishop to e3 is decent. Tigran castles, and now here comes bishop to c5. This is Bobby's idea. He wants to trade off Black's good bishop, that is, the one without any of its diagonals blocked by a central pawn, and this bishop is the only piece covering the c5 square, where Bobby would like to plant his knight. Tigran responds with the best move, rook f to e8, just defending the bishop. The trade is made, and now another very strong move from Bobby Fischer. The best move in the position, try to spot it if you like, but here it comes in 3, 2, 1, b4, supporting the c5 outpost for the knight and fixing black's pawn on a6, where it's being eyed very hard by that bishop on d3. And you might be wondering, why can't you just push the pawn to a5? Well, because then white would respond with b5, with a very powerful passed pawn. Not worth it. So what to do is black? Knight to c5 is coming, when the a6 pawn will be doubly attacked. Tigran decides to defend with bishop to c8. That's his plan. It's kind of sad, but what else? Rook to a7? That's even sadder. So in preparation for bishop to c8, he needs to defend his rook on e7 from the rook on e1, hence the move king to f8. Bobby's horse leaps into c5, bishop to c8 on the board, and now f3, depriving the knight of some squares and giving the king some quick endgame access to the center of the board. But the engine is not impressed. It thinks there are better things for white to do, like getting a rook to c1 and then doubling on the c-file, while black's pieces are tied up defending the a6 pawn. But after this sort of tame f3 move, black can start to untangle himself with knight to d7, a move which Tigran did not play, but it's a strong move. You're challenging that pesky knight on c5 right away, 
I don't know what Tigran didn't like about this. I'm sure he must have considered it. Maybe he expected rook e to c1, which would maintain the advantage for white if black didn't have this move rook to e3 with a threat to the bishop after knight takes c5. And if this bishop moves, you're going to slide over to a3 and target the a2 pawn, which is going to be kind of inconvenient for white to defend. So some not so obvious counterplay available to black here, found by the engine, of course. But in the game, in this position, Tigran took a much different approach. He decided to let the knight stay on c5 unchallenged and to doubly protect his a6 pawn with rook e to a7, freeing up his bishop to move somewhere. Not a very pretty setup. These rooks are basically just functioning as a big fat pawn. That is not the role you want them to play to defend a solitary pawn. But let's see if Bobby can punish this weird setup. We have rook to e5. It's a multi-purpose move. You can double the rooks. You're targeting d5. Maybe you can try to get a pawn to g5 and kick away its only defender. Tigran responds bishop to d7. So at least all of his pieces are developed now, albeit to not the best squares. And with this move, we arrive at the position I showed you at the beginning of this video, where Bobby Fischer plays his most infamous move, and it's a move that some of you may have guessed, because it's not all that crazy looking, and may even look completely normal to someone who is not a very strong player. But to the grandmasters assembled in the press room of this event, who are trying to figure out what Bobby should do next, his decision to play knight takes d7 came as an utter shock. They were baffled. The great Miguel Nidorf was disgusted. He called it a blunder. And not because it looks so crazy tactically, and some of you might even be saying, hey, knight for bishop, good trade, right? Well, positionally speaking, that knight on c5 is a beast. On a beautiful square, pressuring the a6 pawn, why trade it off for this passive bishop on d7? A bad bishop, whose mobility through the center of the board is hindered by the pawn on d5? Well, Bobby has determined that it works tactically, and tactics always supersede positional considerations. So what is Bobby seeing here? Well, after his knight takes d7, Petrosian has to recapture with the rook, or else the pawn on d5 would fall. And now we have rook to c1. This is a move which threatens the pawn on a6. And it's not just because of rook to c6, hitting that pawn with the second piece, there is a more immediate threat in the form of a tactic present in this position. Pause the video if you want to try to spot it, but here it is in three, two, one. Bishop takes a six is what white is now threatening. Since if black were to respond with rook takes a six, then rook to c8 would lead to a classic back rank mate. So Tigran, Fully aware of this and realizing the a6 pawn is going to need an extra defender, plays rook to d6. But this was not his best defense. He actually had a better move here, which may have even saved his game, although no one realized it for years to come. Because of the way this game ended, all the top players ended up changing their mind about Bobby's shocking decision to play this line starting with knight takes d7, assuming that it must have been brilliant after all. Because you gotta remember, there were no strong computer programs to check things like we have today. We are so spoiled with our instant access to the truth. But back then, Bobby Fischer was really the stockfish of the day, being the strongest chess player in the universe at that time. And so his performance was considered to be virtually flawless until the 21st century chess engines began to show that Black had a potential route to survival here with the move D4 opening the d5 square for the knight. Now white can still take on a6 due to that back rank mate threat, but then the d pawn is going to d3 and then to d2 pretty quickly, causing white some trouble. So better would be rook c to c5 because you want to stop knight to d5. Black has rook a to d8, adding more defense to d5. So knight to d5 is coming and will be attacking b4. So a3 anticipates that, and after knight to d5, you want to play g3. You do not want that bishop to be driven from blockading this d-pawn. From here, the knight will pivot on c3, like so, and go to b5, targeting a3. So this is the line that would have given Tigran his best chances for survival, though Stockfish still says this is nearly a pawn in white's favor. But I want to get back to the game. After we see how that concludes, 
I'm going to come back to this position and briefly show you the game that Stockfish plays against itself from here so we can see if Black can actually hold this position or not, giving us the best possible answer to the question of whether or not Bobby Fischer's controversial Knight Takes D7 was a mistake or not. But going back to this moment here, right before Bobby takes on D7, I want to show you the computer move that is definitely better than what Bobby played and very clearly winning according to the engine. And that move was a4, preventing bishop to b5, depriving that bishop of its only active square. The engine gives bishop to c6 next for black, and then white can just make slow improvements in the position while black remains in a completely passive defensive position. In some lines, you can even exchange the bishop and the knight for the pawn and the rook on a6, and then win with these two connected pass pawns. The engine is saying that it's almost two pawns in white's favor here. But humans, including Bobby, tend to prefer more concrete variations. So in the line that Bobby played, with knight takes d7, rook takes d7, rook to c1, which was the second best way for Bobby to play, he did have excellent winning chances, as evidenced by Tigran's move rook to d6, which was a mistake, since finding the computer defense of d4 was just too difficult over the board, Bobby continues, rook to c7, threatening rook to e7, which would cause a big disaster on f7. Can't allow that, so we have knight to d7, blocking the c7 rook's view of e7, while attacking the rook on e5. So it goes back to e2, at which point Tigran is beginning to get into some sort of a zugzwang. He has moves, but he's running out of any active or highly useful moves. If rook to e8, then we just trade, and the rook goes to a7 to target a6. So what to do? Well, Tigran plays g6, giving the king some luft, so no more back rank mate threats for the moment, and Bobby, realizing that Tigran is getting all tied up, knows he can play the long game and just makes some slow improving moves. He plays king to f2, inching towards the center, we have h5 from Tigran. This is a good move, a subtle move. Black is threatening to now untangle himself with knight to b6. You'll see why in a minute. Now a good move for white here would be to play a4. While you can, before the knight goes to b6, so that when it does, you can immediately kick it with a5. But Bobby made a mistake here with the move f4. I assume he wants to double the rooks on the c file and doesn't want the knight to have access to the e5 square. But this pretty much gives away the win. Tigran had a drawing resource here which he didn't find, and that was knight to b6. What about rook to e7, you're asking? Targeting f7? Well here, because of this move h5, black can safely play rook to f6. Targeting f4, and because g4 is guarded, the position of the black rook is secure and will not come under attack with g4, g5, with the help of the h-pawn if necessary, at least not quickly enough to cause black any problems, as would be the case if h5 was not on the board. So a missed opportunity there, but in the game, after Bobby's mistake with f4, Tigran blundered with h4. Not sure exactly why this was played, but it would have allowed Bobby to regain the winning advantage by just doubling the rooks, threatening to come into c6, but instead he gets distracted by the undefended h-pawn and plays king to f3, threatening to go to g4 and win that pawn, which black should just ignore and play d4. And then after king to g4, you got knight to f6 with check, followed by knight to d5 with the counterattack on b4 and black will have enough counterplay here to hold the draw. But instead we have the blunder, f5, keeping the king out of g4, but allowing Bobby to quickly centralize his king with king to e3. Now we do have d4 with check. It's not as good now, but still worth a try. It at least keeps Bobby's king out of d4, drives him back to d2. We finally get the move knight to b6, headed for the juicy d5 square, but unlike the line we just looked at, where the knight was able to pivot on f6 with check, this move does not come with check and so allows the rook penetration to e7. Knight d5 does arrive with a fork, but it's a little late. Bobby has rook to f7 check, king goes to e8, 
The other rook gets out of the way of the knight, and now with the doubled rooks on the seventh rank, this game is not gonna last much longer. The threat is simply rook to h7, followed by rook to h8 mate. And what are you gonna do? Well, black has several sad options, which will prolong the game and hold off mate for a while. You can try rook to b6, you can even try rook to b8. Both fail, you can pause the video and try to figure out why if you want. But let's take a look at Tigran's move. He grabs a pawn with knight takes f4. He's a pawn up, it looks good on paper for the moment, but after Bobby's next move, bishop to c4, which is the top engine move, and a forced mate in 13 from here, Tigran has had enough, he can't see a way out, mate is coming, he knows it, and resigns. Bishop to c4 was preparing to capture the knight if it goes to e6, so that it can't drop back to f8 to block the mate that is coming. So if you want to see the forced mate, it goes like this, knight to e6, I'll just go through these moves very quickly without much commentary. White ends up winning the knight on e6. So the win is in the bag even without the forced mate. But here it is anyway for you to see. We have some typical sacrificing of some pieces by black. The only purpose of which is to delay the mate by a few moves. Okay, rook to e1, rook to e2. How silly is that? And then with this move h3, white finally executes checkmate with rook to a8. So there you have it, a true masterpiece by Bobby Fischer. Despite its imperfections, which were very subtle and even undetectable by extensive human analysis, and only really revealed with the advent of strong computer engines in the 21st century. So to round out this video as promised, I want to show you the line that we looked at earlier, the computer defense that could have potentially saved the game for Tigran Petrosian after Bobby's knight takes d7. Okay, so here we are in the critical position. I have Stockfish fired up so you can see the evaluation, and you can see it's about a plus 1.8 pawns in white's favor. So white has a comfortably winning advantage here if a4 is played, which of course is not what Bobby Fischer played. He went with knight takes d7, and we immediately see the valuation drop down to about a pawn in white's favor. And the reason, of course, after rook takes d7 and rook c1, is due to the defensive resource that Petrosian had, which was d4, the move he didn't play. But we're going to take a look at this. It's stockfish versus stockfish. Now, I gave it at least five minutes for each move to analyze, so it could have a nice deep think. And I'm just going to quickly go through these moves to show you what happened. All right, so I already talked about this line. The knight goes to d5 and then it jumps into c3, ends up getting to b5 and targeting that pawn on a3. So then white targets the pawn on a6, it's defended, and we have a whole lot of the shuffling of the pieces, um, you know, typical computer stuff. Eventually what ends up happening, I believe, is yes, we have this pawn trade here. After a little more shuffling of the pieces, okay, we have a trade of rooks, I believe the pawn on a6 eventually drops after some checks. And so white does end up a pawn up. But black's pieces are very well positioned to stop the pawn from advancing. And stockfish is not really able to make much progress. Just a lot of shuffling of the pieces until eventually it just kind of gives up on advancing the b pawn. And we have a trade of pawns it's got to be getting close. Right around here somewhere, we get, yes, right here, where the bishop takes on f7 and the rook takes on b4. And this is a known drawish scenario because all the pawns are on the same side of the board. You know, black's king and remaining pieces are well positioned. The rook harassing the white king there. And there's just you're just not going to turn one of those pawns into a queen. It's just not happening. So I think at this point, yeah, that was the end. It's obvious. You can see the evaluation of Stockfish has gone way down to only a third of a pawn in White's favor. It realized that this is not really a winnable position. And so it appears that Bobby Fischer's knight takes d7 was objectively an inaccurate move. It led to this potential 
drawing line that Petrosian could have played. But practically speaking, it did make life very difficult for Petrosian, and he couldn't handle it, and that's really all that matters. It's really easy to criticize when you have Stockfish revealing the absolute truth in a matter of seconds, and finding variations that humans couldn't find even in years of studying. Quite remarkable how the world of chess has changed. I might look into this A4 line later on, maybe have Stockfish play itself after this move and see just how that game ends. I'm assuming that this is not going to be a draw. Once you get up around over one and a half pawns on one side's favor, usually that will result in a win, even when it's engine versus engine. But that's enough for now. Thanks for watching. Please subscribe to the channel if you want to see more content like this in the near future, and I'll see you next time.